I'm Ed Thomas. I uh, am a full-time volunteer for the Natural Hazard Mitigation Association. This is not legal advice. I always have to say that. It makes my insurance company happy. And it has to do with risk and resilience for me. I, I, I always like to mention that disaster risk reduction is not a luxury. And I really dearly wish I could use a U.S. politician to say something like this. Uh, but we have to use the UN because we, we're not saying that a whole lot in the United States that disaster risk reduction is absolutely required and it is part of a resilient world. Natural Hazard Mitigation Association exists to help practitioners at the local level achieve disaster risk reduction in the overall context of resilience. Uh, we, have, we try and develop partnerships facilitate training, and a whole lot of other stuff. I'd like you to think of resilience and disaster risk reduction as a target. It is a moving target. It moves with the climate. It moves with human knowledge. It use, moves with human uh, desires for different things at different times. And let me be clear. These arrows of resource that we are shooting at the idea of resilience are usually going very far astray. We're spending millions and billions of dollars in a way that will not produce resilience and disaster risk reduction. We need to find the bullseye of this moving target based on safety, economy, health, human dignity. And we're generally not doing that. As we do this, I really hope all of you will always keep in the back of your mind this wonderful publication from uh, Island Press uh, uh, that was funded by the Kresge Institute called Bounce Forward. We've heard a lot about Bounce Forward today. It's about resilience. It's talking about incorporating disaster risk reduction into the concept of resilience. Uh, this is a groundbreaking publication and also a publication on equity uh, from the uh, NAACP in the United States talking about incorporating this into those most vulnerable populations. We have to keep that in mind just in terms of moral terms, economic terms, whatever, whatever argument you want to make. Question for the group. How much has the United States spent on disasters, disaster response since 1983? Anybody? What do you think? 750 billion. 750 billion. I got 750 billion down here. I got 750 billion. <laughs> Trillion dollars. Trillion bucks. I mention it because it was not spent as a federal investment by and large. We're seeing heroic action by people like Ian Hyde in Colorado trying to spend this as an investment in the future. That's generally not what we're doing. We rarely incorporate greenhouse gas reduction, energy efficiency into post-disaster recovery to say nothing of building things safely and properly. Safe development is affordable. Yes, we have to think of some type of failure at some point, hopefully a graceful failure, but we can do enormously better at disaster risk reduction based upon zoning and building codes, and we generally are not. This is something that is not controversial politically. The most conservative organization, or one of the most in the United States, is the Cato Institute. And it is against a lot of stuff. Uh, like, for example, I think it's unconstitutional that we have Social Security, minimum wage laws, the Environmental Protection Agency, and OSHA. But they and the United States Supreme Court endorse the idea of making people who do development pay for safe and proper development, not externalize their costs to society at large. Cato Institute specifically says that compensation under the U.S. Constitution, the so-called taking issue, is not due when government prohibits wrongful uses. When government acts to stop someone from polluting their neighbor, it is not a, a subject to constitutional prohibitions. We need to reach across the aisle to talk to those folks in their lingo and in their way. Other people, such as my great hero, Mohandas K. Gandhi, British trained attorney, knew something about morality, knew something about nonviolence, great influence on the philosophy of Dr. King, talks about 
this idea of not harming your neighbors with the development activities, which is a fundamental concept, a maxim of property law. And maxims are considered inarguable and universally accepted. This goes back to Greco-Roman law, sic utere tuum et alienum non leras, use your property so you don't harm other people. This is fundamental to our understanding of what one can do. It comes over to the United States from British common law. Gandhi also goes on to say that we need to act as trustees to use natural resources wisely as is our moral responsibility to future generations in a healthy planet. As was, was very clearly set forth in an article just a couple of days ago in the Financial Times talking about the climate change uh, work in, in Paris. We need to think about how morality, law, and equity support safe development and understand that we need to educate on true risk as part of resilience and come up with what we would call in NHMA transformative behavior higher standards of care, thinking about litigation, thinking about the kind of inspiration that Kristen did this morning for us, and thinking about the opportunities. It was mentioned that we're gonna be talking about multiple billions of dollars worth of construction on infrastructure. Dale mentioned that earlier. Actually, take it a step further. 50% of the improved square footage of real estate that exists in the United States of America that will exist in 2050 does not exist today. We have the opportunity to get it right, and we are generally not taking that opportunity. And that opportunity would involve transferring risk to the people who are making the profit. We need to think of risk in the concept of resilience, risk of what to whom, what is their vision, what is their, their, their timeline. If you're a developer and you're building down on the beach in Charleston, South Carolina, and your vision is six months because you've got to get in, get out, and you're gonna do this, you're gonna have a, a, essentially six months after you finish this, you're gonna be done. Your risk is very slight you are resilient with respect to natural disasters as much as you want to be as shoddily as you can get away with. We need to understand that. We need to understand better that how much local government benefits from that construction and how wise it is from the local government tax perspective to allow that construction to take place. It's a report I would just like to just mention. Uh, it's called Hide from the Wind. It's the story of how in central Oklahoma they are transforming the concept of safe rooms in Tornado Alley in the United States from a rather esoteric, rarely used concept into something that is becoming more universally accepted based upon multiple different respected sources conveying a common message. Common message in different language. The governor may be saying this is a good idea, private industry being developed, FEMA working with the International Building Code Council to get this put into the International Building Code, lenders putting up billboards, not saying you need a safe room, but saying we'll give you a low interest loan, perhaps a more powerful message on that topic of risk reduction, saving your family. A lender, a uh, credit union putting up on their website that we will give you a zero interest loan. Not saying you need a safe room, but saying instead, we will facilitate you doing this. So I think we need, based upon the, the, the findings of Dr. Dennis Maletti, a common message delivered by multiple different sources in multiple different ways about resilience and buildings. And we need to pitch it to different people in different ways. Some people we can pitch it based on morality, some people based on economics, some people based on future generations, uh, and we need to frame it in terms of the person that you're trying to convince. Folks, we've got a product that we're trying to sell. Whether we call it resilience, or risk reduction, or sustainability, or maven. Just pick another word. We can do all this stuff. Uh, I think we need to 
point, point out that resilience is an enormous business opportunity, and we need to have specific messages for specific audiences uh, for, for actions that need to be taken for lots of different reasons. We're working on a disaster risk reduction ambassador curriculum that's going to be cross-cutting, talking to a lot of different people in a lot of different ways, trying to educate and to create a group that will be committed to this. Fundamentally, we need to choose a different approach. We can either do what we're doing now in terms of development, or we can do something that will reduce devastation and litigation, and we need to find the common values. This is America's first political cartoon, talking about the need to unite against a risk, and the particular risk was uh, the, the Kingdom of Great Britain. And the idea was to unite or die. And folks, I think we in this room need to unite in order that we have a resilient and better future. Thank you.